So good to have all of y'all with me here today. So let me share the screen here and we will get to our topic for the day. Let's dive back in. We're going to talk about how to see and catch the light. And I want to start with one of my all-time favorite quotes. This comes from Hans Hoffman. Hoffman said, in nature, light creates the color, and in the picture, color creates the light. And I'm hoping that by the end of the webinar, this is going to make tremendous sense to you because we're going to look at lots of examples and exactly what Hoffman meant by that. It is a crucial concept to understand. And it's, it sounds a little complex when you read it or when I say it, but it's really actually very, very, very simple. So let's break that apart. So what the Hoffman is saying is that in nature, when you're out looking at the world or looking at a photograph, but in nature, light falls across the objects and it creates the color that our eyeballs see. The color that we perceive is created by light. It's light that comes from the sun from a certain angle, so it has a certain color, and it falls across an object which bounces that light back giving us another illusion of color. So nature, in nature, light creates the color. If we want to capture that illusion in our paintings, we have to reverse engineer that, which means in the picture, color creates the light. So we observe, it's really a two-step process, and we're mainly going to talk about the first part of that tonight, but we'll get a little bit into the second. It's a two-step process. We have to observe how light is affecting the color of the objects that we're looking at. And then when we're painting, we use color to recreate what we saw. It sounds super hard, but it really isn't. There is a method and a system that you can use for looking at things and observing and then translating that into color in pigments on panels or canvas. That's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So what you can expect tonight is that we're gonna first talk about how light creates color. That's that first part of the two-step process. And we're gonna talk about the difference between the physical color of objects and our perception of that color because there's a huge difference between the two. Most people get stuck on the physical color of the objects and they never get to really seeing and understanding their perception of the color and that it's a vastly different thing. So because we are predators, because we are hardwired for laser focused vision, and labeling everything we look at to determine whether it's something we can eat or not, we have a hard time bypassing the control box in our brain, the monkey mind, shutting it down, the left brain, and letting the right brain take over and just observe the colors that we see. Instead, we wanna label it and categorize it. So we're gonna talk about that in depth because I think that is, quite possibly the most important thing that we're gonna talk about tonight. Second thing we're gonna talk about are some really, really super low-tech tools, three simple low-tech tools that you can use so that you actually see the color of the light impacting the local color, so that you can recognize what your eyeballs have seen since you were born and really begin to synthesize it and translate it into your paintings. I'm not talking about fancy computer software or fancy color systems or apps on your phone. I'm talking about things that are either already attached to your body or things that you can pick up really easily at no cost. So these are zero cost tools, really easy to use ones. Then we're gonna wrap it up talking about the seven steps that you can use to really implement color creating light in your paintings. So we're gonna 
take both ends of that phrase that Hoffman used. Nature, light creating color, and in paintings, color creating light. We're going to talk about both halves of that thing. So number one, we're going to talk about the difference between that physical color of objects and our perception of the color. Remember, we are predator critters. We are designed and hardwired, and I know this sounds gross, as killing machines. We are designed to go out there and hunt for stuff to eat. Yeah, we eat fruits and vegetables too, but especially if we're on a good diet. But the way that our brains are set up to interpret visual information is there to keep us alive by eating things that we catch. And in order to see them, we have to keep that labeling machine going. That's really useful when you want to eat. Not so much when you want to paint. So we've got to turn that control box off so that instead of what we know is there and labeling it and focusing on the objects, we can start to take what our eye sees and directly interpret it without that filter box in the way. Let's first define what local color is. Local color is the physical color of the object. And this is the number one mistake that I see artists make when they're trying to create the illusion of light in their paintings, they get stuck with local color. And then they wonder why it's flat, why it's chalky, why it's dull, why it doesn't feel like it's illuminated and has a lot of light. It's because they've stopped with the physical color of the object and they've just added white to make it lighter or black to make it darker. Well, black and white will dull a color when you mix them together. So what you end up having in those illuminated areas is a really chalky, light, dull color. Not gonna create a sense of light. Certainly not a very strong sense of light. So to create the strongest sense of light, you need to use something called optical color. And it means exactly what it sounds like. Optics, your eye. It's the perception of color rather than the physical color of the object. And that perception is impacted by the light that's present falling on that object. So a good illustration to think about there is an apple, a red apple. And if the light is low angled and kind of winter light where it's red orange or yellow orange falling on that apple, where there's a highlight, you're gonna have not pink, but yellow orange. That's the key to creating that strong sense of light, is using optical color. So at its simplest, you're taking the color of the object and you're mixing the color of the light with it. Cool, huh? You just have to eventually know what the color of the light is. That's the, the kicker in that mix. But all you have to do to create a highlight is take the local color of the object and mix it with the color of the light. Cool beans, huh? So optical color is the system that was used predominantly by the Impressionists. It was, it's been around for a long time, actually a lot longer than the Impressionists, but they're the ones who are credited with really making it more mainstream. So they got fascinated by visual perception. That really was a good chunk of what the Impressionist movement was about. And we're all familiar with Claude Monet. He actually wrote a good deal about color and observation. And he said, the richness I achieve, and he's talking about his paintings, comes from nature. It's not something that's inherent in him. He says, perhaps my originality boils down to being a hypersensitive receptor. And I love that phrase, hypersensitive receptor. That's what I want all y'all to become, hypersensitive receptors. I want you to become hypersensitive to the visual color information that you're getting through your eyes to your brain without that control box getting in the way. So what he's talking about there with hypersensitive receptors 
is not something that's necessarily inherent inherited. We're all born with a certain number of color bars and each one of us has a different number. Some of us have missing color bars, which is why we, some people are color blind. And all of us are gonna see color just a little bit differently. But despite what we might be born with, we can train ourselves, we can learn through observation to see more. So I don't have too much scientific data to back up some of my theories about color bars, but I think color bars, and those are the rods, are, that's undeniable science, but I think color bars are very much like neural pathways in the brain, that the more you use them, the more developed they become. And the reason I think this is because I know in myself that the more I train myself to observe and see color, the more color I see. I tell this to my students who catch the light all the time, that the more you look, the more you'll see. And the more you see, the more you'll see. Until you get to the point where the world is alive and awash with color. It's not that the physical worlds are different for two people with two different perceptions. It's just that one person's color bars and receptors are at that hypersensitive level and somebody else's are not doesn't mean you can't ever get there. So if you've ever been frustrated by not being able to see some of the colors that other people are seeing, I want you to know that you can develop that ability. And all it's gonna take is some time sitting and looking at those colors. So you need to spend some time in observation. So when we're looking at local color, versus optical color. Remember, local color is gonna give you the physical color of the object with white or black. Optical color is gonna be much richer and it's going to try to create the illusion of the perception that the artist saw. So let's walk through an example of that. This is a photograph of a building on the, old, the Columbia College campus where I used to be a faculty member. I taught painting there for over 20 years. And I took this photo of the building that was right outside my office window one fall, late fall in November, in the late afternoon before I left work. And we used it in the, the CCL class to teach this concept. So when you are looking at that light, it's very low angled. And the angle of the light can make a big impact on the color of the light. And by the angle of the light, I mean the position of the sun in relationship to the earth. Time of day can affect that. Time of year can affect that. All kinds of things can affect that. Geography affects that. So the angle of the sun at that particular time, it's winter, uh, late fall, early winter, and it's late afternoon, about 3, 34 o'clock. So it's really low angled. At that time of day, it is orange. Yellow orange to orange. It's very, very warm light. And because of that, as it strikes the brick, the red brick, it transforms the colors that our eyes see there. So what colors do y'all actually see on that brick? Go on and type into the chat roll if you see anything besides a red brick color there. Anybody see something besides a red brick color in the highlight areas where the sun's striking? How would you describe that color? Think about that color. I'll blow that up just a little bit so that you can see that a little bit more clearly. Absolutely, Donna. It's orange. Yes, Meg. Orange and yellow. Leslie says orange. Right on it, y'all. You're absolutely right. And there is a little bit of pink in there. It's a little bit richer than burnt sienna, Donna. If you're gonna try to capture that so that it recreates the illusion of light, you've gotta keep the intensity much higher than you think you do. Because when you're painting, you have to exaggerate those contrasts just a little bit so that people see it the way you did because you're standing back from it. 
So the light striking the red brick, and that brick on that building is slightly dull, a slightly dull red. It's a warmer red, but it's a red red. And when the warm yellow orange, orange light strikes it, the brick is no longer red. It becomes orange. And in the shadows, the brick is no longer red. To be true, truthful, there is no part of that building in that photograph that reflects the actual local color because all you've got there is shadow and highlights. In the shadows, you have the absence of that warm orange light. And so the yellow orange light. So what you're gonna have in the shadows is the local color overlaid with the complement of the color of the light. That's one of those really cool things that happens when you start observing, you notice that in the shadows, you have the absence of the color of the light. And that means that the color that's overlaid is the complement, which in this case is blue violet which is why you get that really violet color there in the shadows. So that time of year, you're in the fall, you have a lot of violet in the shadows because of how orange, yellow orange, the light is. Does that make sense to y'all? Absolutely right, Carol, those shadows are purple. If you paint them with black, because black has a little bit of blue in it, That'll look better than the highlight part, but it still looks flat and dull. So I have an example next of painting that building using those two color systems. So in the top right-hand corner is a version of that painted using local color. So to create where the highlight is, where the light is striking, I just mixed the red brick color with white. In the shadow area, I mix the red brick color with black. Compare that to the one underneath it, which is created using optical color instead. It's much, much richer to look at, and there's a much stronger illusion of light. Remember what Hoffman said, color creates light. So this is absolutely hands down the biggest problem I see when people start trying to paint the light is that they're still in local color mode they pull out their tube of white and their tube of black and they use those to lighten and darken with the colors that they're painting with and then they're crushed when the painting looks flat and chalky don't do that so I tell my students a lot of times don't mix lighter values with white don't mix darker values with black. There are, of course, exceptions to that. I don't have any rules when I paint. I have guidelines. So there are colors you have to mix with a little bit of white for them to either lighten or intensify. Blue of the sky, for example. Dye colors, for example. But in general, when you want to lighten a color, you want to use an equally intense but lighter valued color. So that's what I did in that bottom one. Let's look at that a little larger again. At least one edge of it here. Oops, a little too far. So you see the edge there where it's really, really orange, a little tiny pink orange, as somebody said earlier. So I mixed a little bit of red with yellow to make an orange. That's a mixed color. And that creates the illusion of the light that we saw in the photograph. To make the shadow, I took a cool red and I mixed violet, blue violet in with it. And the shadow color becomes a red violet. And in the deepest part of the shadow, it's more of a violet, blue violet. Does that make sense to y'all? So that's what optical color is is that you are trying to use color, the warmth and the coolness of the color, you're using the color's position on the color wheel to create that illusion of what we saw. So we wanna practice seeing that as we're observing the natural world. And the tools that you can use to practice that observation are really, really simple. In fact, you've got two of them attached to your body already. So number one, 
the first one we're going to talk about is this set of things right here, your eyeballs. I don't know if y'all can see me in the little screen in the corner, but the first thing that's going to count is your eyeballs. We have the tools in place to be able to turn off that hard laser linear focused vision. And we can use something called wide angled soft vision, like your peripheral vision, to see more like prey animals do, like horses and sheep and goats and um, cattle see. Prey animals have a, a wide focus vision. When you see wide focus vision, it's easier to, when you use that, it's easier to see the color masses and not focus on objects. So we're gonna practice that in just a minute. But the first key to doing that is to relax. Because if you are hepped up and too energized, you're gonna to be too laser focused and too left brain. So to engage the right brain, and this really is a physical transition that the more you do it, you can feel the shift happening. You have to first relax, take a deep breath. And no, we're not gonna do meditation time. Then we're gonna practice this with an exercise here. Now, pardon the, the really crappy photo over here on the left, but it's the only photo I've ever been able to take of the color of the light in the fall as it strikes the pine trees in the late afternoon, early evening. It is this vivid red, orange, red. It's actually more vivid than what you can see in the photo. This is as close as I've ever gotten. And so it makes a great example of this. Pine trees, we know in our minds, our left brains are not red. Pine trees, we have been taught, are brown. They're really not. They're kind of a of lavender gray but the brown tends to override whatever we see with our eyes because the logical part of our brain wants to control. So if we want to engage our peripheral vision so we can actually see the colors, there are a couple of different ways we can do that. So this first one, I want y'all to test it. I want everybody to stare at the words that are on the screen on the right-hand side stare really, really hard. And then while you're still looking at the words, look at the photograph out of the side of your eye, the corner of your eye. When you do that, you're engaging peripheral vision. There's absolutely no way for you to still be linear and hard focused when you're staring at one thing and using your peripheral vision in the corner. So stare at the words, and use your peripheral vision to see that tree, those trees. And then I want you to type, yeah, Deborah's ahead of me, type into the chat roll the colors that you see there. Go in and type into the chat roll the colors that you see on those, that photograph. Don't label objects. See color masses instead. Color masses fall across different objects. You don't necessarily see the object, but when you're looking at just the color masses, the objectness of it goes away. Absolutely, Holly. Coral, gray, yellow, green. Meg says vermilion and lavender gray. Dora says orange, pink, and lavender. Barb says coral too. And Sharon says deep brownish purple. Absolutely, well done, y'all. Yeah, there is a lot more color than our brain wants us to think about there. When you look at that photograph, if you blow it up, that's another tool you can use to, to see it if you want to use a tap tool. When you blow it up really large so you can't see the objects anymore, you'll notice that it's really a vivid coral red. It's almost a Chinese red that where the light is striking. And then there's a sudden change to the lavender gray that is the trunk that's more in shadow. And where it's in deep shadow, it's much more of a deep violet. Really, really rich color. So that light only lasts about 15 minutes. And I just happened to have my paints out. I'm gonna show y'all what I did with that in just a minute. I did a really quick, 15 minute, 10 minute study of it. I wanna try this again. So we got one more test here. And I wanna try a little bit different method this time. 
So there are no words to focus on. This one, I want you to, this is a feel. This is one of the reasons I love to paint fields. They're kind of like a blank neutral canvas that accepts all the color from the light and the sky. It makes a wonderful pattern across the fields. So stare at the photograph and then for a, at least 10 seconds and then turn your head slightly to the right so that you're looking at it with your peripheral vision. You'll have that same shift happen that happened when you're looking at the words. So stare hard at the photograph, then turn your head slightly and look at it out of your peripheral vision. Look at the colors that you see there. You're gonna see gray greens, lavenders, corals again, it's common color at that time of year, gold, pinks, yellows. I agree, Deborah, orange and purple for sure. And in fact, when I painted that field, there's a lot of lavender and purple in the painting. Yeah, it is a magical trick. See, I told you, you're gonna see more color and once you start seeing it, Lalia says, wow, what a reveal. Yeah, it's kind of magical, isn't it? And once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. And the more you practice it, the more colors you're gonna see. I'm glad you love this, Deborah. It's one of my favorite things to teach. So when we're looking at, at that, I want you to paint what you see, not what you know. That's what turns off the monkey mind, turns off the control box, is when you paint what you see. So we talked about the first tool, and let's try one, I guess I have another one in a minute that we'll use. Let's try one more method here for you to use. And that is the other thing that's attached to your body, your fist. So you can use it, when you look through a really small hole, it eliminates the objectness of what you're looking at. Color pickers are what we, we're gonna talk about in a minute, but you don't have to go and make one. You can use your fist to do the same thing. So if you're out in the landscape and you don't have half your tools, you can use your fist. Look through it like a telescope at that painting, at the different sections. And because your fist in that tiny little hole isolates the color, you're gonna see the actual color as I just pulled my headphones out, get excited about the colors and then it all goes away. You're gonna see the actual color instead of the color your brain is trying to tell you about. So use your fist. They sell really fancy tools. So we're gonna to talk about the third tool. First was your eyeball, second is your fist. The third tool that you can use is that color picker, that color spot tool. I don't advocate that you go buy one, and certainly not a fancy one. They sell them at Jerry's and Ditblick and all those sorts of places, and they have lots of fancy values to either side of it. Please don't go spend your money on those things. And here's why. When you get one of those fancy color spot tools that has the holes going down the middle of it with nine different gradations of values, and you're holding it up out in the landscape while you try to paint. You're running up to the object and then backing up and running up and backing up. Which part of your brain is engaged? Anybody guess which part of your brain is engaged? Those of you who are thinking left brain are correct. That kind of tool engages your monkey mind. It engages the control box, the left brain, left side of your brain. That's not what we want to do. So while those can be useful, used in really small instances, they are not the tool you wanna to rely on. It's involving too much logic. Instead, what I would recommend is that you get either an index card or a piece of cardboard, or if you really wanna go fancy, get a middle gray paint chip from the paint store. You know, those sample chips they give away, and a hole punch. Push the hole punch in on the card as far up as you can punch and punch a hole in it. Now you have your color spot tool. That's all you need. Having the middle gray makes it easier to figure out what the color actually is because you have something to compare it to. So don't go for the high tech stuff. 
Go for the low tech stuff. It will keep that right brain engaged. And I want to take a minute to kind of sidetrack here just a little bit. I'm going to recommend you do not download all the fancy apps that will show you the values or create the NOTAN for you because you need to train your brain and eye to work together. And while those can be helpful when you're first starting, if you rely on them, you're not ever going to train your brain. And because it engages the left brain again. All of those fancy tools and fancy systems engage the left brain. It's another reason I no longer teach colored theory according to systems like Joseph Albers theories or the Munsell system. And the reason is, and I've used those for years. I was an academic. I taught colored theory every year. And I taught using those systems, the traditional Bauhaus style of teaching color design and design. The trouble is, it's a great theory. It doesn't work in practice. It doesn't have anything much to do with how physical paint is mixed and how our eyes and somewhat how our eyes interact with it. So that people get all caught up in the rules and trying to remember the rules and they can't paint and they never train their eye. So while there's helpful stuff in there, I don't advocate that you dive down the rabbit hole of color exercises with us and especially don't do what I've seen. I've even seen some people teach this way. You know that the Munsell system comes with, if you order the full Monty, you get all of these little color chips with a hole punched in the middle and you're supposed to run back and forth to the thing you're painting to match it up with the color chip. That does not work when you're painting from life. The landscape is not going to hold still. The sun's not going to hold still while you're trying to color chip your subject. The model's going to get really tired while you try to color chip her leg. So don't color chip things. That's not going to long term benefit you at all. It engages that left side of the brain way too much. Instead, get a color spot tool, use your fist, or use the eyeballs that you've got here. That will train you to see more so that you don't need anybody's fancy, expensive color chip system. So let me know if y'all have any questions about those tools that we've just talked about. Any ahas from that? Anything at all that kind of resonates deeply? Any big ahas there? Like the big reveal. Yeah, I love that. So I want you to also think. Oh, I'm glad, Deborah. I'm glad that's helpful. Even Joseph Albers himself, and I love Albers. I'm passionately fond of his paintings, Homage to the Square, that explore those color relationships. But one of the most important things that Albers said was that color deceives continuously. And what he meant by that is that colors interact with each other and relate with each other. And how we perceive one color is dependent upon what it's next to. And we're going to dive into that in just a minute deeply when we talk about the seven steps. But color relationships are more important than a color chip system. So let's look at the relationships here. This is what I mean. So the that photo is on the left again and on the right is that really, really quick study that I talked about that I did. Not a great painting. I did it in 15 minutes. It's a reference for other work. But I was trying to capture that light as it hit those pine trees. So one of the things that makes the color that I mixed for the pine trees look lavender is that it's next to its complement. So it looks kind of violet because it's next to a yellow orange, the close complement. Colors exaggerate their contrast when they're next to each other. So I was able to take a color that if you saw it on my palette, and in fact, when I've taught that in person in workshops, when I mix that color up, it's one of my favorites. It's uh, violet and yellow ochre mixed together. It makes a wonderful neutral, but it looks like mud when it's on the palette. When it's on the painting, it looks like it's a lavender violet color. And it's because of what it's next to. Colors lie. They tell us things that are not true. 
And we have to know that and know how we're going to be able to recreate those illusions. Carol says she just realized how to use the color tool to mix paint. Cool. Excellent. That is awesome. And Leslie says, what constitutes a neutral middle gray? So if you think about middle gray is the value that's halfway between black and white. It's not literally half black paint and half white paint. It's the color that is halfway between those two. So if you Google value chart on, in fact, I will do that while we are on here. If you Google value chart, then you can see an example of that. Let's see. Here we go. Let me share this really quickly for a minute. I'm going off just a hair here, but I think it's worth looking at. So when we look at this image here, this one goes to 10. I usually, oh, it's actually 11. So when I'm numbering value charts, I usually do a nine scale chart. 11 is good too. You want to use an odd number. So one, I usually do it the opposite. One is white and 11 is black. In the middle, the number in the middle, in this case, it's the five right here. That's middle gray. It's halfway between the black and the white. And the more you look for that, photographers know that, um, they use grayscale cards to check exposures. And I used to teach photography, so I'm, I'm tuned into that middle gray value. That middle gray right there is what you're judging everything else against. And when you look at this one, which is a really great example of what Albers was talking about, you can see, everybody see how the, the gray at the top looks darker than the gray at the bottom? Those are the exact same grays, but there's an illusion created that it's darker up here because of what it's up against. Awesome, isn't it? It's amazing what it can do. So back to our regularly scheduled program here. Let me go to, back to this one. So you can see the same thing happening here in this landscape painting. This was the spring light that's again that same kind of angle as the fall so there are a lot of violet shadow colors and i'm contrasting close complements again to create that illusion of light if you look at the pink that i use the kind of orangey muted orangey pink that i use for the light there it's not really that intense what makes it look so intense and create that strong sense of light are all the purples that are surrounding it that make it appear more intense. So the colors that things are up against will make things look more intense. So now we're gonna dive into those seven steps that I mentioned, because I am gonna run on too long if I'm not moving myself along here. So the seven steps are first, what we've talked about already, to observe and identify the direction of the light. We talked about that a little bit in terms of optical color. The two things that affect the color of the light, the main two things, it's not the only ones by any manner of means. And we dive deep into this and catch the light because there so, are some other factors like atmosphere and um, time of day, all of those other things. But you want to observe the direction of the light. Where is it coming from? Is it high angled or low angled? For example, here in the southeast at noon in the summertime, the sun directly overhead, it's white light. It is hot white light. Only time of year we have light that's that white. So the angle of the light, the direction of the light has a profound effect on the color of the light. Then observe and identify the color. We practiced that earlier tonight when we were using those tools, and y'all did a fantastic job of that. You now know how to identify the color of the light. And a real trick to that, you know, you look at the light as it hits a neutral subject, like the field, like the pine tree, 
when in doubt, take a piece of white paper, put it outside and look at the color of the light and the color of the light areas and the color of the shadow areas. Step number three, really, really, really important one in turning off that monkey mind. Let go of preconceptions. Let go of what you think you know, in air quotes, that color is. Just go by what you see. Use those tools that we talked about so that you're seeing the color masses instead of what you think you know. Use optical color. Really important. We're going to talk about some of the things that you can do to use optical color in just a few minutes. Look for those color masses. Just like when we looked at the photograph of the tree and we weren't observing tree and pine needles and leaves, we were observing pink masses, reddish pink masses, coral masses, lavender masses, violet masses. And when I asked y'all to describe those, nobody used the object name. Did you notice that? That's because you turned off that part of your brain. Great work. Sixth thing is use the, the color masses that you've just identified to create a value roadmap. Crucial, especially when you're painting from observation. What I mean by that is that you're going to capture how those values and colors are arranged in the composition, the frame that you're looking at. We're going to walk through that in a second. If you've got the value roadmap, you are golden even if the light changes. So it's a super useful thing to do. Then keep comparing the relationships of the colors, just like we did when we were looking at the pine trees and noticing that the colors of the trunk became much more violet because they're next to that red orange. One of the things that Hoffman also said that I think has a big impact on how we use paint, how we should use paint, is that you create form by how you use color. It's not the form that dictates the color, it's the color that dictates the form. So don't paint objects, paint color masses. And when you do that, the objects magically appear and it truly is like magic. So turn off the monkey mind and let the objects appear. So I wanna look at this one for a minute as an example of that. This is a photograph that we use in Catch the Light for the module on painting snow in winter and the light in winter time. We have a lot of preconceptions about the color of snow. And most of us would say, well, snow is white. We all know that. Trees are brown. We're back to those preconceptions again. But look at the shadows, the color of the shadows there as they play across the snow. Snow, like the field, is the perfect receptor for the color of the light. And where the light is not striking, you have the removal of the color of the light. That's why you have the blue-violet there and the, the real beautiful, almost cobalt blue shadows there on the snow. And if you looked at the snow where the light is striking close up with something like a microscope or um, like a scanner or Photoshop, and we do that actually in the course, you can see that the warm part where the highlight is, is actually kind of a cream color. It's warm. It's a warm white. Anytime you see white in nature, it's almost never going to be perceived as white by our eyeballs. So again, really approach white with caution because white is almost never white. There are no white clouds. There is no white snow. Same thing here. Let's think about our perception. This is a shorn field. It's the photograph from that painting that we just looked at. It's a cornfield that has been whacked completely back, and there's some green grass growing up between the rows, but they haven't planted yet for the spring. It's early spring. So the actual color of the field is a really neutral tan, but as that warm light rakes across the field, that tan becomes orange, that coral color again. And the shadows become violet, really violet. And if we want to recreate that in a painting, we're going to have to be sensitive to that. So let's, when you look at this painting, 
you can see where I've exaggerated those contrasts just a little bit to recreate that illusion. So you have to exaggerate the contrast that you see there to recreate the illusion. That's being sent a hypersensitive receptor and being very sensitive to the relationship of the colors. Keep comparing them to each other. Pull out that color spot tool and compare one color to the other as you're trying to identify the masses. So for example, and let me get my annotation tool here because I do love to draw on top of these. This area right here is a fascinating one to me. It's this kind of little block that was created by that island of trees blocking the sunlight. And it takes on a really blue, lavender, violet cast. And it, in order to create that sense of shadow, I had to exaggerate it a little bit. And you can see how much I exaggerated it over here. It reads correctly when you look at the painting, but if you zoom in really close, you go, why is she putting blue-violet streaks on the field? There's no violet on the field, but there is according to our eye in the shadows. Kill the annotation tool there for a minute. One of the things to help you to create that strong sense of light is to understand that you can't use the exact same hue, color, like red, blue, yellow, orange, for both the highlight and the shadow. Think back to that red brick building. As the color of the light overlays on top of the local color, it's going to change. And so you have to change the hue as well. Which is why in this painting, you can see that the highlight pine trees again, you can tell I'm obsessed with them. The highlight color becomes that coral color. The local color of the tree is that light lavender color. The shadow color of the tree is the red violet. So I've got coral for the highlights, red violet for the shadows, and a more neutral lavender for the actual local color. I haven't just added white to that local color. I haven't just added black. Here's that photograph. And when you look at the photo, you can tell just how orange that light really was. And when you look at the greens that are in the background, you can see how they've been impacted by the color of the light as well. As warm red-orange light strikes green, they're compliments. You're going to end up with a duller green, but it'll read as highlights. It'll read as a warm green. And so that's the, let me grab the annotation tool again. That's this green that's right here that our eye still reads as green, but on the palette looks brown but it is where the light is striking the side of the bush. So keep in mind, to erase that now after doing it, I have a tendency to write all over photographs. Keep in mind that you've got to keep comparing those relationships and overlay the color of the light on the col local color of the object. Oops, too many tools to play with. So quick recap of that, seven steps. Observe and identify the direction of the light, then observe and identify the color of the light. At that point, then you're really to, ready to take that deep breath, let go of what you know, and start using optical color, where you use an equally intense, but lighter color for the highlights, and an equally intense, but darker color for the shadows. Then look for the color masses, create a value roadmap, and keep comparing those relationships of colors. If you would like to dive into deep, uh, dive in deeper in that, I have the course that I've mentioned earlier called Catch the Light that's open for enrollment right now. But even if you are not ready to sign up for the course, I hope that you've gotten some stuff tonight it's going to be valuable to you as you go forward painting light and filling your paintings with color and light. So I want this to be actionable and I want you to go out and practice this tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that. 
and be sure to let me know how it works. Tag me on Instagram or Facebook at Mary Gilkerson Art. Let me know how it works. If you're interested in joining the course, and that's all we do in this course, is we dive really deep into color and light and how to translate what we see with our eyes onto the canvas so that you have an understanding of how that color of the light is impacted by all of those other environmental factors. And then you get to do what I call painting towards the light. You're not just catching the light, you're painting towards what you know is gonna happen. It makes it so much easier to capture that illusion. And I'm gonna share that link right here, if I can grab the right link here into the chat roll so that y'all can go check it out and see if it might be a good fit for you. So Anne says, can you use the same tools for light when painting from a photo? You sure can, absolutely, absolutely you can. And in fact, in the course we paint from photos because um, it is just more convenient when you're teaching to paint from photos and videos that we've got demo videos in there so that you can paint along with me. A lot of the photos that we looked at tonight are the demo photos that we use in the course, like that one of the snow. So you can absolutely apply it. And as you're starting out, it's probably easier with photographs and then move out into the landscape. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that one of the bonuses for the course is at the very end of the course, you get a bonus module on taking what we've covered in the course out into plein air. So I've got this long video that I shot of a field. You know, I talked about that being a neutral palette. And you can watch the field that I've painted so many times and paint from your computer without actually having to be outside. So it's kind of like uh, painting plein air with training wheels because a lot of people get nervous about painting plein air. And you can practice that over and over again in the comfort of your studio. So let me walk through really quickly, if it's okay with y'all, um, what is included in that course. Let me grab, just lost Chrome there for a minute. There we go. Share Chrome here for a second. So what's included in the course? is that you'll learn to see the qualities of light, what we call the light key and the light envelope, so that you have that so that you can paint towards the light and you kind of have a pretty good idea of what's gonna go on there before you get outside or before you even look at the subject. You're gonna be able to identify the light key and the envelope of any subject that you're looking at. Capture the light at different times of day, different seasons, different weather, different atmosphere. We've even got a nocturne in there. That's one of my favorite things to paint. So the course is completely online. The only part of it that is live are the weekly Q and A's. So we have Q and A's on Tuesdays usually, occasionally another day if I'm traveling. And we hop on and do a Q and A critique of where everybody is at that moment. No worries if you can't make it, when it's scheduled because it's recorded and that recording goes into the course portal. We also have a bonus private Facebook group where you get the support of all the people who are in the course at that same time. I think one of the benefits of being in a course is that you learn as much from each other as you do from the instructor. But in there you can post your work, you can ask questions, you can get support from other students. And it's a wonderful supportive group. The supply lists are included with your um, enrollment materials and you have access to the course portal for a year. You actually have lifetime access to the course because everything's downloadable to your desktop computer. The files are too big on any kind of downloadable course for a phone or an iPad. It would fill it totally up. You can absolutely watch on any device at any place that has a good Wi-Fi connection. You can do the whole course from your phone, but you can't download the videos to it because it'll eat up your, all your memory. Download those videos to your hard drive and you've got them forever. You can rewatch them forever. 
So all those materials are yours to download. The way the modules break out is that it starts with an introduction that's on seeing the light and color. And you'll find this webinar housed in the course too, so that you can go back through it as many times as you want and download it and keep it. And there are also several exercises in there to work through first so that you really understand how mixing mixed color is going to interact. So we mix all the colors of the color wheel. We mix all the colors that we're working with with white to see when that tipping point is. Then in module one, we start working on the light key and seeing the qualities of light. Module two, we go to the light key of the time of day. Then three, the time of year. Then atmospheric conditions, some of my favorite things to paint. Fog, rain, smoke, and humidity. I am known for chasing after those um, control burns out in the country. Then in module five, I told you I love nocturnes. We've got low light conditions. And then in the last one, we've got light extremes, sunrises and sunsets. Those can be particularly challenging. What's included in the course is the course itself, that's six modules with over 20 lessons, all the videos that you can download, the handouts and worksheets, the live weekly Q&A calls for a year, private Facebook group, and I have four bonuses for you. First is the light key guides that's included within each module, so it's kind of like a cheat sheet of what the light key is for that situation. Then there is a special bonus module, optical color for any subject at the very end. Because in reality, even though the course is focused on landscape, this actually applies to any subject we're talking about. Yeah, Doris, it would help with pastels. Now, pastels have some advantages in that the color is pretty pure to start with, but it definitely applies to creating that illusion of light with pastels or watercolor or acrylics or oils. The demos are in oils, but you can absolutely translate it to pastels. I've had a number of students do that. The third bonus is the color mixing recipe guide. That has the recipes in there to mix all of the colors, the secondary and the tertiary colors from the double primary palette that I use. It has the color you use to mix all of the convenience colors that I have that are suggested. So, for example, one of my favorite convenience colors is violet, Egyptian violet, dioxazine violet. You may not want to buy that. I've got the recipe to mix it yourself from the crimson and the ultramarine blue. So, that handy recipe guide is of tremendous value all by itself. Last bonus is what I was talking about earlier. It's catching the light plein air. That's at the very end when you can take your optical color adventures outside. So I've got guidelines in there on how to paint plein air, how to take the information that you've gotten from the course and then go apply it to your own paintings outside or from your own photographs. And that's where that long video is so that you can practice before you go do that. I have a no risk guarantee for the course because I firmly believe that nobody should be stuck when they buy something. So you have a full 30 days to try it risk free and get a refund. I don't make people tell me why. I, I want to know if there's something that's wrong with it, but you don't have to give me any explanation. So you don't have anything to lose trying it out and I'd love to have y'all in there. So the course has three different payment plans. You can save almost 150, almost $200 by paying in full. And the full price of the six module course with all those bonuses is $599. If you would rather pay over four months, you can pay $189 a month for the course. If you'd rather stretch it out a little further for your budget, then I've added in the six month option for $139 a month. All three are available right now over on that page with the, the link that I typed in earlier. So if you have any questions remaining about the course or about what we talked about tonight, I want to give us time to go over those. So let me go through the chat roll here and catch any questions that came in. I'm going all the way back up to the beginning. So 
I'm gonna get through the introductions and get to the meat of the questions. Cindy says this was big time helpful. It's the first, the first aha is all I'm gonna use. I've gone down the rabbit hole with color mixing values, but they're a help for color recipes. They are, but you can get way too left brain caught up in that. And I've had friends that spent months on mixing these elaborate color charts that they then don't, then don't pull out when they're painting. I think it's much more valuable to mix a color wheel that goes out to the tertiaries, and that's what we do in the course, because then you can pull your color wheel out if you're not sure what color you need to mix, and you've got it right there in your hand. You mix it on a panel so you've got it and it dries, and we're, you're eyeball to eyeball, and it's not so left-brained. So definitely. Then let's see. Ann had asked, can you use the same tools when you're painting from a photo? You sure can. You can use your fist. You can use the color spot tool and you can use your peripheral vision. Remember, we did that tonight. When we looked at those photos, we were using our peripheral vision. So absolutely those tools will still work. Put them into practice. I am so glad Peretta that helped and Tim, excellent. Cindy says, should I identify the light mass first to get the correct shadow color? Yes. When you're trying to figure out what the shadow color is until you get used to it, you want to figure out what color the light is, the light color mass. You want to know the color of the light because the shadow color is going to be the complement of whatever the color of the light is all the time. So here in the southeast, in the summertime, where we are right now, the color of the light is barely, barely, um, it's warm in the late afternoon and evenings, but the shadow colors tend to be more blue. In the fall, they're blue-violet. In the wintertime, they're more blue again. In the spring, they're more red-violet. So again, it has to do with the color of the light as it changes in those seasons. If you're in a different hemisphere, then it's going to be impacted by how close you are to the equator or not and when the season of the year is for you. So winter is going to be winter, whether you're in the, the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. Don't think about exactly which month it is. If you're sitting right on the equator, then the seasons of the year aren't going to change very much and the sun is going to stay in relatively the same position in the sky. It'll just change for time of day. Somebody had asked me that earlier and I meant to, to elaborate on that. Kim, you are most welcome. And Deborah, I am so glad that that was helpful. Diana says, what are your convenience colors added to the double primary palette? So the colors I use on the double primary palette are the warm red and the cool red. And that tends to be because I paint with Williamsburg. Fanchon red for the warm and the Carl's Crimson for the cool. Then for the blues, I use ultramarine blue and phthalo blue. For the yellows, I use Indian yellow and yellow ochre. And I know the yellow ochre seems a little funny to people, but yellow ochre is a slightly duller, cooler yellow. Indian yellow is almost pure yellow. And depending on how much white I add to it, it's a dye color, I can make it warmer or cooler. So it really does double duty. And yellow ochre is great for mixing greens. The convenience colors I use are the violet, doxazine violet. It's a super intense color. One tube will last me a couple of years. Then I love Montserrat orange, which is a Williamsburg color. It's a coral, pinkish coral. I always use, always, hands down, always, um, Italian terra verde. It's an earth color that is green a rich green, rich earthy green from Williamsburg. And it's got a really great consistency for people who paint plein air with palette knives. So I love that color. Um, there are a few others that are in and out of my box, depending on what time of year it is. I love green ochre, which is a cooler version of yellow ochre. It makes great lavenders when it's mixed with the purples. And I feel like I'm leaving something off. But I think, oh, for other greens, I do carry sometimes cinnabar green light and permanent green light. 
I never use them straight out of the tube. They're just too strong. I much prefer to mix my greens, vastly prefer mixing my greens. Um, Joni says, could you please repeat about optical color? Okay, optical color is the colors that our eyes perceive. So you want to, instead of when you're trying to mix, you, I recommend you mix three values for each color mass. You have the middle value, the central value, the, the overall value of the color that you're looking at. Tends to kind of be the local color, but not always. And then you want a highlight color and a shadow color. When you go to the highlight color, don't lighten it with white. Instead, go to the equally intense, lighter color on the color wheel. To create the shadows, go to equally intense, darker colors. And it's because the color of the light overlays the physical color of the object and they optically mix. That's why it's called optical color. So I hope that helps. Jan says, love the way you have the photo in your painting side by side. I am so glad that's helpful. Eileen says, how long will it be open to register? It's gonna be open for the next four or five days, I believe, Eileen. So if you run into a problem with that, just email me and let me know. You're most welcome, Joni. It has been fabulous having y'all here tonight. So quick recap, what we went over, because I don't want anybody to forget the, the important stuff we've covered. We talked about the difference between local and optical color, and I'm so glad, Joni, that you asked that question. We talked about the three tools that you can use, really low-tech tools that you can use to see the optical color, peripheral vision with your eyeballs, the fist, telescoping fist with your hand, and a color spot tool with a piece of paper or cardboard. And then we talked about the seven steps to begin to translate that into a painting. The direction of the light and the color of the light from observation, letting go of preconceptions, use that optical color, look for the color masses and create a value roadmap, and then dive in and compare those relationships throughout the entire painting. So thank y'all so much for joining me. Anybody else have any other questions at all? Yay, Barb, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And Sharon, thank you, I'm glad it's been helpful. Yay, Eileen, she says she's finally understanding. I love it when light bulbs go off. I cannot tell you how long it took me to get it. I had read Hoffman, I'd heard Hoffman in graduate school. My, one of my professors studied under one of Hoffman's students. So Hoffman is my grandfather you know, education wise. I knew it intellectually. I did not know how to put it in practice. And when I finally figured it out, it was like a light bulb went off and it was magical. And I love sharing that information with other people because it's fun when other people can capture that magic too. So thank you so much for joining. Oh, Carol says, how do we get an accurate value tool? When you're starting to look for values, I think one of the most helpful things to start out, this is the only time I'll say use an app, and I don't want you to use any kind of complicated app. I want you to use the simple app. I want you to use the photos app on your phone or whatever similar app is on another kind of phone if you've got a droid or something else. When you take a photo, and then you can desaturate it in the photo app. So if I take a photo out the window right now, we've got a storm out there, it's raining. So I'm not sure you're gonna be able to see it because my phone is not connected. I'll hold it up to the screen. So there is the photo. You can see the kayak hanging on the fence outside my studio window. And I can open that, it's open now in my app. I can click on edit and the tools there will let me convert it to black and white. So when I click on color, I can click on saturation and I can completely take all the saturation out. I can completely eliminate hue. And there it is in black and white. So that helps you to train your eye. 
I don't think there's anything wrong with using tools. You just don't want to become too dependent on them. They're really good for starting out. Certainly all the great masters use the tools that were available to them at the time. Just don't get caught up in those that are too overly analytical. Excellent. Yeah, that makes it a little bit easier to select a good medium gray. And remember, it just needs to be in relationship to everything else. So it needs to look like it's in the middle compared to the other colors that are around it. Don't obsess too much on getting the perfect middle value because it's got to be in the middle of what it's up against. See, you can, you can make anything work if you're, you're understanding that it has to be in relationship. So cool. Excellent. I'm glad that helps. If you have any other questions, be sure to either send me a message via Instagram or Facebook or send me an email at studio at marygilkerson.com. Happy to answer any questions that come up from what we covered tonight or about the course. Hope to see a bunch of y'all in there because I would love to help you take that walk towards catching the light. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now and happy painting. Go out there and catch that light.